Anytime I got tired, I came back to Bangkok. Anytime I got sick, I came back to Bangkok. Anytime I needed to catch up on work, I came back to Bangkok. It became my happy place. I felt comfortable here. Most people are not born where they belong. You have to find it. You have to explore and run and chase and, 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 and fall until you find that place that you belong, you feel comfortable. Hi, my name is Eric Prince, and this is One Night in Bangkok. What is up, guys, and welcome back to the One Night in Bangkok podcast. If you guys are new here, hit the subscribe button. I know a ton of you are visiting or moving to Bangkok or Thailand soon, and I want to make sure you check out all the cool people that are coming on in the, in the next few weeks. Also, we have a new Facebook group. If you have a lot of questions about how to get set up here, how to get a bank account, how to get an apartment, we're answering questions in that. So you can check out that down below. And if you have any comments or questions from my guests tonight, be sure to leave those as well. We love replying to you guys and helping you guys out and we love your comments. So without further ado, tonight we have a guy I've been following on Instagram. I've been Instagram stalking you for a while. <laughs> Photographer, philanthropist, and world traveler, Eric Prince combined his love for photography and travel to create MinorityNomad.com, one of the premier travel blogs for African-American and Latino travelers, inspiring low-income communities to explore the world and document their travels through photography and video. Eric has turned his hobby into a thriving business, visiting 95 countries along the way. Through his blog and digital marketing company, Eric has worked with brands such as Facebook, Singapore, Lan Airlines, Lonely Planet, Intercontinental Hotels, and Sony. Mm, that guy That's sounds impressive. That guy sounds impressive. That's a <laughs> lot. So right off the bat, I want to tell everyone, the reason I like this guy and I follow him is because you have a very mature view on travel and different cultures. Pretty, pretty much the complete opposite, in my opinion anyway, of the TikTok generation. That's like, I've been in this country for five minutes. Here's mm. everything you need to know. I oh, know everything about it. Trust me crazy. So let's jump into it. Where are you yeah. from originally? Uh, Texas. Well, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, but I call it Texas home. Okay. Because uh, I ended. I grew up in Cleveland, but ended up in Texas when I joined the military. And I like to say that's when I became a grown-up. When I joined the military and moved to Texas and became a Texas resident. Lived in Austin after I left the military. So Texas, I'm a Texan. Okay, cool. I like Texas. I'm from Boston. Yeah. But I've been to Texas a bunch. I, in fact, I would say if I didn't live in Thailand, I would probably live in Texas. I, honestly, I, it's, it's interesting. I know so many people from Boston. My partner, her family's from Boston. Um, one of my good friends, Nomadic Matt, who was just here, he's from Boston. But I always tell people Boston's probably the most beautiful city in America, in my opinion. Really? Stunning. I absolutely adore Boston. Interesting. I always, in, for comparing it to Thailand, I always kind of compare it to Chiang Mai because it's got a lot of like historical right, kind of right. stuff there. It's not, a, it's not a huge city like New York, nope. but it's got a lot of cultural stuff. A lot of character. But I think one problem we have Americans have is America is so big and within it, there are so many places and cultures and things to see and experience that a lot of Americans never leave the continental U.S. Mm. And why, like, what do you think about that? What got you to leave? Was it the military mm -hmm. or? Well, it was growing up in Cleveland, actually. So a lot of people don't recognize how multicultural Cleveland is as a city. And I, I, I've been playing with this idea of making a piece of content about how Cleveland prepared me to be a world traveler. I grew up in, um, you know, Bone Thugs and Harmony? The hip hop group. I've heard of them. Yeah. Uh, Bone Thugs and Harmony I literally grew up two doors down from them, uh, St. Clair. That was the side. That was the black side of Cleveland. Like, and the further east you go, it's East Cleveland. I went to Shaw High School in East Cleveland. That it was segregated. And this is the interesting thing about the U.S. Every city is segregated, no matter how multicultural it is. There are certain areas, and this is me growing up. I was born in '83, so this is me growing up in the '90s in, in the U.S. So. Every city is pretty much segregated. I'm sure it was the same in Boston, where you had an area where the white people live, slash Italian people, or the, the, the black people live, Latinos live. It was very clear. And the interesting thing about Cleveland was there was these gray areas between neighborhoods where you can interact and mingle, learn a little bit more about each other's culture, but there was a line that you didn't cross. There were certain areas that you weren't allowed to go in. 
And it always made me curious about other places, other people, other cultures, because even though I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood, I was always around people of different cultures. Like our, uh, we, used to, we used to call them Arabs. Uh, now I know it's Arab, but we will always call them Arabs because that's how we said it growing up in the 80s and the 90s. They owned a lot of the convenience stores. A lot of the fast food places that we grew up on were Chinese food restaurants. So you would go to these Chinese food restaurants and you would hear Mandarin, you would hear Cantonese, and someplace you would actually hear Thai. I my my babysitter was she was Hungarian. So this is this is in the nineties when everything happened in Yugoslavia. So a lot of refugees were coming over and that's how we ended up interacting with them more so in the Midwest. So I grew up on Polish cuisine, Hungarian cuisine, Czech cuisine, well, it's now Czech cuisine. And I was like, okay, what is out there? What else is out there? What else is in the world? Because this is time, you remember uh, the Watchtower? that um, the Jehovah's Witnesses would give you when they came on Saturday morning? No, I've never had that. Oh, my goodness. So you should Google it. The Watchtower was this paper, like this this really fine paper leaflet that they would give everybody. Like, oh, no, thank you. You know, I'm, I'm Baptist or Southern Baptist, whatnot. And they, oh, thank, here you go. And they leave. But the stories in this, they were religious stories, but the stories of other people, other cultures, Reader's Digest, obviously National Geographic, opened us up to an entire different world beyond Cleveland. So for me as a kid, very being very inquisitive, being exposed to these different cultures in my own city, it made me look at the world as a place that was possible, if that makes sense. But do you think that's just like you? I, there's a lot of kids that may grow up in a similar situation. Mm. But I feel like they don't observe these things the same way yeah. you do. Well, I think everybody's different. When you you can have two people who grow up in the same household who have very different worldviews. We see it all the time politically, where you have a divided household down a political line, even though they grew up exactly the same way. So I do believe that one of the aspects, and we get a lot of flack as Americans for not being as internationally inclined as other people, was well, because the world comes to us. That's one of the benefits of being in America. Yeah. The world comes to you us. Know, do you ever have this experience? Someone will ask me uh, where I'm from, mm -hmm. and I'll say, uh, I'm American. And they say, well, you don't look American. Really? And what? But what does that... I always say, what does that mean? And I, I've never had that. Really? I've never so had I, that. I, I, the only thing I can think of is that maybe their view of America or what America looks like comes from movies. Always, so if you don't always. fit into that certain look, then mm -hmm. you're not American. But we know yeah. that it's not about how you look. Mm. It's about, you know, at, you know, for a lot of people, their families coming over, the culture that they that mix together with mm -hmm. other people's family, just kind of like you're describing. So, um, yeah. So what drove you though to leave the u.s was it the military that first got you it was it was curiosity uh really but it, it wasn't like that one thing i can't point to one instance of oh this is the thing that made me decide to live abroad or travel the world more so um i had my, my first son when i was 16. my mother had me at 13. so we were a very young family and one thing about our family is there was never any excuses in terms of uh, raising a family or taking care of your family you had you just made it happen you just made it work um and my way of making it work was going to the air force so my original plan was to go to the air force academy i was in JROTC um, when i was in high school and that was the master plan was to go to the academy um either the air force academy or west point uh, but i was a single father so there was a, a barrier for that and back then there was issues with being a single parent and going into the academy so my recruiter kind of hustled me a little bit and because I wanted to be a pilot, I want to be a fighter pilot. So he said, well, you can't go to the academy, but what you can do is you can go into aircraft maintenance and then go and become an officer while you're in the Air Force. That was the master plan was to do my six years in the Air Force and then become an officer in the Air Force, become a fighter pilot. Didn't work out that way because I signed up in January of 2001 and then 9-11 happened. And the entire U.S. military changed very quickly. The world changed, obviously. So all of a sudden, I'm in the U.S. military during wartime, during one of the worst 
10 years and I was in the Air Force for 10 and a half years. One of the most turbulent times in you know recent history in terms of conflict and war globally. And I think what really sparked this interest of traveling the world or living abroad was being abroad. Being, I, I remember I was in this place called uh, Karshi Kanabat, Uzbekistan. We called it K2. Um, it was a um, forward deployment base um, in the Middle East. And well, in Uzbekistan, the country of Uzbekistan. And I remember we did the, we had the six days on, uh, one day off uh, schedule. And during that one day off, once a month, they would do these R and R trips into, um, I want to say it was Samarkand, and uh, I'm gonna have to think about that again. I'm pretty confident it was Samarkand because it's been a while since I thought about this. Um, so we go in. I was the only black guy because a lot of times I was the black guy in the unit. It wasn't uh, a lot of brothers in in my uh, career field at the time. So we go in. And people were calling me, uh, oh, Mike Tyson was the only thing. Yeah. Oh, Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson. And I'm like, what are they saying? And the interpreter said, oh, Mike Tyson is like the black person that almost everybody here knows. Mike Tyson. <laughs> oh, Mr. Tyson would like to know, why is this tiger in your bathroom? And, then, and I'm like... Mike Tyson. Yeah, you don't look all, like Mike Tyson. <laughs> uh, I don't look anything. Hey, I don't look anything like Mike Tyson. Yeah. But of all the black people in the world that you could come up with, it's Mike Tyson. Well, it could be. It could be worse. It could be like Urkel. All you have to do is hitch up your pants, bend your knees, and stick out your pelvis. I'm telling you, baby, it's better than that. <laughs> it could be. It could be way worse. But it was this, this, this embracing of me as just a a, a person abroad. And again. Obviously, the Mike Tyson thing made it even more funny, but I was the first black person that so many of these people had ever ever met. I'm literally in somebody's wedding album. We were out doing tours, and a married couple asked to take pictures with me. And I'm like, I, I don't understand why, but okay, great. It was just all kindness. We would have little kids running around with us. Now, when that happens, are, were you ever offended at first? Never. Never? Not even a little yeah. bit. Because, because I think it comes from a place of, and even in hindsight, like, you know, way years down, you know, over 20 years later, I've, I'm never offended by this when people, and it still happens today where, people, where I'm like the black person that somebody met for the first time. And back then, I was a kid. It was just surprising and curious to me that I was embroiled, like in the middle of this brand new culture. And people embraced me because where I grew up in Cleveland, like I was saying earlier, there's lines you don't cross. Like you're not sitting at the dinner table in a traditional Italian family in Cleveland in the 90s. That wasn't happening. But I'm in an entirely different country in another part of the world and people want me in their wedding photos. And I'm literally wearing jogging pants and a t-shirt and people were embracing me like family. So I think experiencing that really set the, the the foundation for my curiosity to see what was around the world because all of a sudden I'm in this different culture and then I get orders to Okinawa and then I'm getting orders to Busan. I get orders to Turkey and then I get orders to Germany. A lot, a good part of my career is overseas. So I'm interacting with these different cultures around the world. But then when I go home, it's like, oh, you're just another face in the crowd. So I think being abroad and being seen as a human and people wanting to hear my story really set it apart. Yeah. And so that was your introduction to Asia through the military. Yes. Yeah. And where did you go? Did you went to Japan? Okinawa. I was stationed in Okinawa okay. and I was stationed in Busan, Korea. So I'm curious, like how you ended up here in mm. Thailand. Like what was the interest to come to Southeast Asia? So uh, I, I came to Thailand the first time in 2004, I believe. I was still in the military and it was just boys being boys kind of thing. Um, and the only Thailand I had seen was the Pattaya party, Bangkok nightlife, girly bar culture. Um, as a, that's what we did as soldier. Yeah. That's what I, we did. I have a friend visiting right now and he is on yeah, that track. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. <laughs> and it was, it was a blast. It was an absolute blast, but we didn't see anything. We didn't really see in hindsight. We didn't learn anything about Thai culture or history or cuisine or anything like that. And I mean, even back then, that was like when uh, Western food started to really kind of show up here was in the early 2000s was when the fast food chain started to kind of show up in Thailand. And that's what we were doing. We were eating like Western food and, and whatnot. 
Fast forward to when I left the military and started to backpack around the world. Uh, and this is around 2012. And I, I ended up getting sick in Budapest. One of the best experiences of my life, actually. So this is my first time to Shinshini Thermal Baths, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. It's March and snowing. And I'm in the thermal baths, in these waters, and watching the snowfall through the lights. Uh, have you ever been to Budapest? No, I've never it's, been to Europe. Oh, you got it. Oh, it's, it's phenomenal. So I'm in these thermal baths. It's snowing. And it's one of the most amazing things I've seen. I didn't want to leave. But it was freezing cold because I was, it's snowing in March in Budapest. So I end up getting sick. And uh, two days later, I go to the doctor to say, oh, you have, you're coming in. It looks like you have a minor infection, maybe strep. And you, you need rest. You need it to be somewhere warm. And in my head, being somewhere warm means I need to go somewhere warm, not stay warm and uh, stay out of the cold. So I booked a one-way flight to Thailand because it was on my itinerary anyway. I was planning to be here in uh, end of April anyway. So I just pushed it up a little bit. I was like, okay, I'll just fly to Thailand now. So I book a one-way flight to Thailand and I get to Bangkok and I fell in love with the city. Like I moved, uh, I ended up, Get booking a hostel is a place called Refill Now on um, Sukhavit 71. And I think it's still actually still there on 48. Uh, right, like literally, what, five minutes from where we are right now. And I basically lived in that place for six months. They, I had a room that was just my room. And I kept my bag there. I rented it out. I just kept that room in the hostel. And the interesting thing about that area, that was Sukhavit 71, uh, pretty 48, was there was no foreigners there. The only foreigners you would see were people who were going on their way to that hostel because it's deep in the back of a soy. Like you don't accidentally end up there. You were there specifically for that. That's where I learned Thai because the, the ladies who were serving me my food saw me every single day and I would order in English and then got to a point where they would not let me order anything in English. They made me learn Thai. Any dish that I wanted, That's great. I had to order a tie. Then the laundry lady did the exact same thing. Like, wani, puni, like when I wanted like my laundry back, like when can I, I that's how I started to learn. And then I'm like, wait a minute. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm becoming a local now. I'm kind of becoming part of this community here because every time I walked on the street, it was just smiles and hugs and high fives and whys. It was just love. And then it was time for me to leave. And I got back on the road. You know, I started going to the island tours, went to Malaysia, Cambodia, went back to Europe, started traveling the world again, because that's what you do. You're a backpacker. Anytime I got tired, I came back to Bangkok. Anytime I got sick, I came back to Bangkok. Anytime I needed to catch up on work, I came back to Bangkok. It became my happy place. I felt comfortable here. And I always say this now. Most people are not born where they belong. You have to find it. You have to explore and run and chase and, 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 and fall until you find that place that you belong, you feel comfortable. That is a great quote. Where, I don't know about where you're from. Uh, where I'm from, it's people feel the opposite. They feel mm -hmm. like you're born, I'm from Rhode Island originally, mm. the smallest state in the US. Mm. And uh, people don't, nobody moves to Rhode Island, yeah. you know? But in the people that live there have been, their families have been there forever Generations, and they yeah. feel like that's it. But where you're from, I'd imagine it's kind of the same. I'd, I'd imagine you get a lot of weird reactions when you're traveling all over the place. You know, it's interesting. Really, people, even early on, people thought it was amazing. People thought it was the coolest thing ever because, excuse me, because as you said, a lot of people don't leave. A lot of people don't leave Cleveland. So the story is, but what's it like? What, what's over there? How do they treat us? Like, what, what, what's, like, what are you doing? Like, how do I do this? It was always that. Like, people have been asking me for years how my family feels about it. None of this is a shock to my family. If you had an interview with my mother, my mother would be like, yeah, that, that, that was, that's Eric. It makes total sense. Nobody was surprised by it because I, I always was the weird kid. I was always curious. I wanted to know more. I, if you gave me an answer, I want to know, but why? 
Like this, it, no, no, this is how it is. That's not an answer to me. I want to know the mechanisms that put this in place. Why do I have to stay here? Why do we have to do it this way? What Can we try something different, something new? So me moving abroad and exploring the world, that was totally par for the course for my personality type. Now, everybody's built different. But for people like me who are curious and inquisitive, we need the road. We need to be amongst we need to be uncomfortable. Like anytime I feel comfortable, that's why I get frustrated with Bangkok a lot. One of the biggest problems that people don't talk about with Bangkok is in Thailand in general, it's too fucking comfortable. Can I say fucking? Uh, yeah, you can say whatever it's, you it's want. Too, it's too comfortable here. It makes you lazy because life is so easy here. Everyone's like, why is everybody moving to Thailand? Because it's easy. Thailand is one of the easiest places in the world. Now, granted, immigration is a nightmare here, but overall, quality of life is through the roof here compared to yeah, back I, home. I agree with you. It is super so, easy. So, and and that comes with a that comes with an issue for a lot of people because a lot of people don't have the not only the self awareness but the discipline to fight against that laziness. It it it, it it's comfortable. Laziness feels good. It's great to put your feet up on the couch and watch TV all day. But how is that sustainable? How long can that last? And then you look up and all of a sudden, three days have gone by, you haven't done anything productive, which is okay if you're okay with not being productive. But if you're trying to achieve something, it doesn't work. And that's what makes it so dangerous and frustrating out here for a lot of people. So it's this real interesting conversation about like, you know, Rhode Island, Boston, Austin, Texas is the same way. Texans are proud to be Texan and from Cleveland. How in the world is it that you're born here, but you've made the conscious decision to live in an entirely different culture? It's fun. It's frustrating. But my God, it's fulfilling. What did you know about Thailand before you came here? Nothing. Yeah, me either. Nothing. I, uh, I, very, very little. I, I find that pretty much nobody like mm-hmm. makes a giant plan about moving to Thailand and it's super planned. It always happens by accident yeah. somehow. Like your but story. But it's different or- though. It's different now though. I think, and this isn't to put my generation above anybody yeah. else. We didn't have the internet. We didn't yeah, have yeah. TikTok. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have Snapchat. YouTube was barely a thing. Right? And you didn't have this massive wave of digital nomads who were literally giving you a a step by step guide yeah. to how I mean you do it <laughs> like yeah. stu- this is how you get a condo this is how you do this this is how you do that even five years ago when I got here oh, I mean there yeah. was in, there was info online there was a lot of info but it's not like now where you open up Instagram uh, and it's just like real yeah, after real it's like Constant. food condos and and I think trip. it's um I was just having this conversation uh with Mark Weens um uh, my name dropping but Mark um we we chat about. Uh, content creation and um, I'm not Mark Weens migrationology um, he has the uh, Pedmark that's restaurant Mark. yeah and yeah. Has, which is the, right near here yeah. there's one right here yeah yeah uh, he's Mark is the OG food YouTuber and he 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 built his industry his credibility his influence here by doing street food in Thailand and the reason that he blew up is not only because Mark is extremely talented at what he does, he's extremely likable, but he was first to market. He was early on before everybody knew about Thai cuisine, Thai style street food, which is why there'll never be another Mark Wiens. But I think he's got like eight, nine million followers at this point because he started before everybody else. And I would say, in my opinion, probably uh, Gary Butler, who's uh, the Roman cook. Mm. Uh, he is, in my opinion, the second best Western uh, vlogger out here. And he's doing essentially something very similar to what Mark did a long time ago. He's just younger and newer at it. And I don't believe that anybody would ever come close to what Mark did because we all have the information now. When Mark was doing it, it was all new. It was all fresh. But now it's saturated. You open TikTok and everybody all of a sudden is a street food expert. So it's it's this, when we came in, even five years ago, there was not this massive barrage of information. If we go to Paris, when you go to Paris, you're going to be like, ah, yeah, I know this. 
Oh, I, I know. Because your entire life, you've been inundated with information and images about what Paris is. It's not a mystery to you necessarily. Of course, there's little caveats and in, 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 ins and outs about French culture, about Parisian culture and history and places. But the base information is there. You know it. It's the same with going to the UK. You have that information. It's the same with somebody going to New York City. It's the base. The foundation is there. But when we came to Thailand, most of that stuff wasn't there. So you had to learn. You had to learn in the trenches. You had to get that. Uh, Joe Cummings, uh, who wrote the very first Lonely Planet Guide to Thailand, is still living here. He's been here like 30 years. And sitting down and having conversations with him about what it was 30 years ago versus to what it was when I got here versus to what it is now are very different worlds. And that's not to say that there's not a lot of stuff to discover because this city, what makes this city amazing is there's always things opening and closing. But when we came here, there was no information. There was very little information for us. And it makes this city so exciting to just show up in a place and know nothing about it. So like that whole tangent is to say, just show up, do a little research, of course, but just show up and it makes the world a difference. And I think that's why I love this city so much because it was really, I would say Bangkok is the first place that I came where I had absolutely no support, no information, had no real preconceived notions beyond the go-go bar culture that I had already seen in nightlife. And it really changed my life. And that's why I fell in love with this place. But to be fair, had it been someplace in South America, I might have had the same experience. Yeah. Yeah, I have a similar kind of story experience. I mean, when I came here, I basically knew there was something about kickboxing and pad thai. Yeah. And yeah. that's only like, <laughs> that's even not even like that true in the end yeah. of the day, because I don't even know any Thai people that order pad thai. So I think kickboxing did like, uh, like not kickboxing, but Muay Thai. I think yeah, Muay yeah. Thai, I think it's an accurate stereotype because I don't think well, it's actually a stereotype. Sure, but I didn't even, yeah. I didn't even understand when I came here how big it, you know. Yeah, oh, it's massive. It's so massive I think sport. you're right. I think when you show up to a place with no expectation mm. and you're kind of just open mm. and ready, that's the way to go. Oh, yeah. I saw you uh, You responded to a guy on Instagram or TikTok. The guy was in Japan or something, and I forgot exactly what the video was, but he was like, this is why Japan is the or Tokyo is the best, whatever. I remember and you had a, a whole, so funny, your response. Can you just like... I don't remember the response, but I definitely remember the video. It was... Um, and it, it, it frustrates me because I feel like... Guys, I'm 40. I'm about to be 41 on Monday. So I can easily, I, I don't take social media seriously because it has not been a part of my life and my identity. So, so it's like, ugh, this is ridiculous. But I definitely know the impact on 22, 23 year olds who yeah. are seeing the world. And Be because stuff. the guy said something like, Tokyo is the best city for this or something like that. And, and it, was, uh, 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 it was frustrating because I'm like, a, uh, and if you notice, I almost, if you ever look at my content, I almost never say best. Yeah. And I almost never say this is the best this, this is the best that. I would say this is my favorite. I would say this is, this is why I think this is the best. For example, I'm working on a piece about um, the best American restaurants in Bangkok uh, for like comfort food for us. And there's pretty much four. It's not that many really actually like American diner style restaurants in the city. It's, it's only four. Um, and I'm like, um, I'll give you guys a little preview. Number one is Bourbon Street, which is next door to this building. It's Bourbon right Street. Here, it's, Bourbon Street. Yeah. it's been there for like 33, 34 yeah. years. Um, and it, it's like, why is it that you feel the need to create this content that shits on another place, even even secondarily? Like, it's, the, it's like, this is the best. This is why Tokyo is better than New York City. What, why do you have to say that? What, what, what's the point? Why don't you just say Tokyo is amazing and these are the reasons why Tokyo is amazing? And it creates this, this, this negativity bias in people where everything's a damn competition. And this, and this is what gets me frustrated about Europeans. I love you guys. I love Europeans. Uh, some of my closest friends are Europeans. But I always feel like this is a thing that comes up in online discourse with a lot of Europeans is taking these pot shots at the United States. Like, cause it's easy. Ah, you guys don't have healthcare. You guys don't have this. You guys suck at this. You guys suck. Yeah, we know we get it. 
we understand that. We we also agree with everything that you're saying. Tell me why Dusseldorf is so nice. Tell me why Prague is so nice. Tell me why Bern- Tell me why your place or your country is amazing and I should come and visit. Not why it's better than my home. Not why it's better than this city or that city. And I'm trying to fight against this negative bias that we have now because it makes people hate each other. And I think that's dangerous. This is why you get a Trump. Like, no offense to anybody who loves a Trump, but it's why you get people like these despots in positions of power that divide people. And I'm not a big political guy anymore. I'm a humanist and I want people to engage with people on a human level. I grew up in a time in America, I don't know how old you are, man, but I grew up in a time in America where I can fundamentally disagree with somebody, but still have a drink with them. Yeah, where we I, could, and I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm about to be 35. So I remember so a time. So right in that range, yeah, yeah we're in the same and range. And by the way, I think we would probably disagree on a lot of different yeah. topics, yeah. but I just appreciate the way you articulate your ideas and you have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's why I have been following you because, you know, I'm not a a black Latino, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm Mm -hmm. I'm just a white guy here in Thailand, Mm -hmm. but I still appreciate your, uh, your perspective on a thing. So it's a, it's about conversation. Whenever I always have this, I always, anything I put out has two, two designs. It's going to, it's designed to entertain and educate. If it just entertains you, it's disposable. If it just educates you, it's boring. It has to entertain and educate. Every single thing I put out there, anything that I say, anything that you guys disagree with that I'm saying now, call me out in the comments and I'll give you the context of why I'm saying what I'm saying. I'll give you the objective facts of what I'm saying. I think it's very important to have in your mind the difference between an objective and subjective opinion. It's important, and I think one of the issues that we're having is people are presenting subjective shit as sure. objective. I, and I think that's a result. A lot of these the younger, the younger, oh, wow. Here these we go. I, no, 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 no. <laughs> the younger generation, they were literally born with you know Instagram in their hand. Yeah. And so the way that they see the world is maybe a little different than you or I, because I remember a time when these things didn't even exist. Mm-hmm. I remember a time when you had to actually uh, be at a phone waiting for a phone call. Oh, you know, yeah. remember that? Or then your mom picked up the, oh, on the yeah, other yeah, line yeah, when yeah. you were talking. They listen in, yeah. yeah. Uh, but what do you think people get, what do you think foreigners get wrong about Thailand or Bangkok <laughs> before they come here? They have a preconceived notion about it. Oh, that list is long. Top five. Let's go. One, prostitution is everywhere. It's cheap. Uh, all Thai people are super nice. They can do pretty much anything they want. Uh, yeah, let's just go with that four. Okay. Uh, I think Let, let's, four. let's talk a little bit about those. So prostitution is okay. everywhere. Yeah. So obviously, you know, it exists, but probably mm-hmm. really only in a few areas. Like Exactly. It, like if yeah. you walk around this neighborhood. It's not here. It's, yeah. It's, no. You go, you, I, and, and I, I, I was just talking about this earlier today um, with um, a French guy who just got here, who's, who's bitching and moaning about Bangkok, uh, saying that, oh, it's prostitutes everywhere. I'm like, no, it's not. It's easy to avoid. I've been here over a decade. Like, I know exactly where. And I'll give you a time frame from a soak BTS and mainly most of the prostitution in Bangkok is central up for tourists, like prostitutes that would engage with tourists. It's from a soak to Nana BTS from around 2 p.m. to about 4 to 5 a.m. That's when you're going to see prostitution loud and proud. Yeah. So, guys, if you're looking, that's we'll, where we'll, you see, go. we'll see you later. Yeah. <laughs> but outside of that. No, right, exactly. not really. And, and 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 I would say um, in the Siloam area, if you're interested in um, you know, in um, man, um, uh, male prostitutes or trans prostitutes, but it's really a drop in the bucket in the, a city of ten million, ten people. million people. Yeah. And I'm like, if anybody who says that, I'm like, oh, you don't know what you're talking yeah. about. You legitimately don't know anything. I live uh, on the border of on in Prakanon. I've lived there for years, and. The number of times I've actually seen like a street walker in that area is maybe twice in 10 years, maybe twice in that area. And I'm like, but where are you staying? Oh, you know, I stayed, you know, somewhere uh, around Terminal 21. 
Yeah, because that's where Soy Cowboy is. Of course you see hookers everywhere yeah, yeah. at night. That's where Soy Cowboy they, I ended up getting in trouble for um, for saying this in another interview that I did uh, with this African sister. And she brought she's like, well, you know, people proposition me all the time whenever I walk down this area. I was like, yeah, because there are a lot of African prostitutes in that area. She's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, if you walk between this BTS and this BTS, you're going to see at least 20, at least 20 black African prostitutes. How do you know they're prostitutes? You know they're prostitutes. Like, like, there's no mystery about it. They, 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 they aren't hiding in the alleys or whatnot. They're very clearly propositioning their services. And this isn't, you know, being racist. This isn't being classes. This is just the reality of what it is here. And if you can't accept that, it's probably best if you stay out of those areas or don't come here. And it's like, it's this Western delusion that we like to we like to pretend that things aren't what they actually are. And when you call something out for what it truly is, people get offended by it. And I'm like, come with me. Let's go. Like, let me show you the reality. Now, mind you, I'm not this guy. Mind you, if you are this guy, you're an asshole. I'm not out here walking around with a GoPro taking videos of prostitutes to put on my social media for clout. I will never do that because it's rude and disrespectful. But if you're with me in person and you say, I want to see it, Okay, cool. We will get off at a soak BTS. We will make a right, go make a left on shell by Little Italy. We'll walk down the street. We'll walk past Crazy Horse and make a left on Soy Cowboy. We'll walk all the way down Soy Cowboy. You're going to get grabbed and touched and proposition. That's maybe a 10 minute walk tops. You get to the end, you make a left turn. You walk right back down to the intersection where the BTS is and you make a right turn and you cross the street and you're going to go past Terminal 21 on your right hand side. Prostitutes are going to just be lined up in the street and the entire time. And mind you, this is one side of the street, all right? Very specifically, the side of the street where Terminal 21 is. If you don't want to engage with a lot of prostitutes, you walk on the opposite side of the street where uh, um, the Landmark Hotel is. Yeah. On that side, there are a few here and there, but for the most part, they stay on the other side of the street Yeah. because there's rules to this here. So it's this this... It's this very limited view. Like you said earlier, they're here five minutes and all of a sudden they're an expert on Bangkok. And that's one of the most frustrating things. Yeah, that's a big topic. So I'm glad yeah. you you, you uh, cleared that up a little. You also said that Thailand is cheap. Mm. And I hear this all the time. Well, actually, what I hear now is it's not cheap. It is cheap. It was mm. cheap. Tell me what you think. The reality is it's was it's more expensive than it used to be of course but it's cheaper depending on co what you're comparing it to i Subjective. mean yeah exactly. i mean where i am from in boston we have some of the most expensive like, oh, you know, cost of living in the u.s so uh, anything is going to be cheap compared yes. to that but if you're coming from a smaller european city i don't mm. know because bangkok I, is the big city of thailand that's uh so i can break this down i would say phuket is the most expensive place in Thailand. Um, and that's because it's European. Phuket is not Thai. It's not Thai anymore. Phuket is Europe, is European. Everything, everything, everywhere down there caters to Europeans, specifically Russians. And it's been like that for years, but after COVID, it has gotten insanely out of, it is flat. They might as well just change all the signs into... Well, they basically have. Because I remember my first trip to Phuket in 2019, mm. I was surprised why all the menus, everything is in Russian. Yeah. I was very, cause yeah. it was. Oh, it's just massive. And, and you know, um, before, well, before, mainly really before the war. Before the war happened, um, we called them snowbirds, you know, like they come down. Um, and then when rainy season hit, they were back in Europe. And, you know, you, you got a little bit more local vibe. But in general, Phuket is European, which comes with European prices. If you look at flights from Bangkok to Phuket now and back, it's insane. Right. Yeah. You remember when you used to be able to get a last minute ticket for a thousand baht. Literally walk, go to the airport. We've done this many a times over the years. You just show up at the airport, buy a ticket for a thousand baht one way, and you're on the island. Now it's three thousand. Yeah, if you're lucky, or more. I, I actually more. was just checking because, like I said, my friend's visiting, mm -hmm. and it's like over five thousand. Yeah, it's now. insane. It's insane for one way flights now. So Phuket, flat out. That's why Phuket is so expensive. Bangkok is number two, and. A lot of old head expats hate this. They bitch and moan about this all the time. Ah, oh, Bangkok's so bad. Uh, you know, people aren't as nice. It's it's because 
the middle class is a real middle class here now. There's a very real upwardly mobile Thai middle class now because the economy here got so good over the past few years that they were able to live an upper middle class life. My condo, my building was almost all Thai. It was very few foreigners that actually lived in my building. And it was not just, you know, just it was, this are, these are doctors, these are lawyers, these are real estate agents, these are flight attendants, these are pilots. My building was just full of middle class to upper middle class ties. And it's still, it's still that way in the area as they build new condos up. If you're comparing Bangkok to a city in Europe, I would say Bangkok and Istanbul are very close in cost. Very comparable in cost. We got to spend a lot of time in Istanbul. That's why I use it as an example. But the further west you go, it's not even close. Like say Berlin. Berlin's one of my favorite cities. Berlin's so much more expensive than Bangkok. It's insane. But you also have to factor in what you're spending your money on. Here, because I, because I train for powerlifting, I'm very meticulous about the food that I eat, about what I, I actually consume. So I do a lot of grocery shopping, which makes my food bill really, really low by comparison. So I'll go get, for example, um, I just recently did my weekly meat shopping. So I, I consume about 4,000 4, calories a day. So I'll usually eat about 200 to 250 grams of protein. So a week that costs me around 35 to 40 US dollars in just meat, in just meat costs. And then I'd say fruits and vegetables are just negligible at that point. Carbs, it's, I don't even factor that in anymore. So in my head, I'm spending maybe on a high end 200, $250 in groceries in terms of just protein and just meats. For rent in my in my building, you're gonna spend around for a two bedroom, one bath, you'll spend around twenty thousand baht, give or take, okay. which so is about five fifty, six hundred. Yeah, US. somewhere around six hundred. Yeah. Six hundred, give or take. Um, in for a two bedroom. For a two bedroom, a two bedroom one. A in two around Prakanong. That's Prakanong. Yeah, that's Prakanong area. Prakanong on the like right yeah, on the yeah. border. Um, transportation negligible. I always, people, I get this question almost daily in, in, in my DMs. Oh, how much money do I need to live in Bangkok? I'm going low. I would say you can feel comfortable about 1200 1300 US dollars. If you're living like me, closer to two, closer to yeah. 2K a month. It really depends on the person and what their yes. expectations are 100% Very much. because like just the apartment thing is a good example, right? Mm. Because you could live in Tong Law mm. and pay 50,000 baht for a one bedroom. Yep. Or you can live in Anud, you can live a little further out, Hoi Kwang. Yep. You, you, the, the variety is so vast. So, so, so many and places. And I think a lot of people, maybe they just get stuck in one, yeah. one place. People are lazy, bro. People are lazy. And, they, and, and so many Westerners don't understand how the city actually works, how Thailand works. Everything is up for negotiation. Oh, yeah. Everything is up for negotiation. So um, uh, we, were, we were chatting about this off camera a little bit. Um, when I sold my condo, so I ended up buying a condo, then sold a condo because I was going to build, I was going to renovate a home here um, because I have a larger plan. And real quick, because I know yeah. people are going to ask this. To yeah. buy a condo here as a mm -hmm. foreigner, what are the rules? You're not allowed to buy land. There's a way around that as an American. It's called the Treaty of Reciprocity. Um Google it. Okay. The, yeah, the, the, the Americans yeah, that's a, that's have a, a special thing. treaty, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get into um, that. But uh, condo, the, the process of buying a condo is super easy here. You got to have money. You have to hire a local attorney. You find a condo that you like. If the, the unit has to, it can go over 49% foreign ownership. The building can't the have building. more yeah. than 49% foreigner ownership. ownership. Yes. 49%. Uh, and that includes, that's not just American, British. That yeah. includes Chinese owners, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and... Uh, it, the, it really the process is simple you got to have cash and getting a loan is an actual nightmare i was blessed that i actually have the money but the real estate here i, I don't go too deep into this kind of yeah. like people knowing what's in my pocket but in thailand a new build here a new condo here you're you'll be able to get one for three million a, a, a western standard condo three million thai bot that's around that's under a hundred thousand us dollars yeah. right now so and r real quick, just generally speaking, mm -hmm. if you're a foreigner here that knows they want to be here long term, yeah. would you recommend buying a condo or would you stay away from it? 
<sighs> just generally speaking. That's tough because it's subjective. It's so subjective. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say do your research on... Well, let me ask you from this point of view. Yeah. What about as an investment, like for investment purposes? No. Right. I was uh, 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 okay. That's easy. I would not. Say, I would say, do not invest in real estate here. Invest in a long-term residence here. If you're gonna live here for 10, 15 years, like you have it already in your mind, like yeah, this is my home. Yeah, go ahead and buy a condo. But as a investment, the reason I say this is because, and and you know how Thailand is. There's just some things we can't say publicly. But I will say this: the governments here. The way laws work here are so much more different, so, so, so different than in the West. Today, something's legal and tomorrow it could be illegal. Like it really things happen that quickly here where there's no there's no proposition. There's no, oh, let's wait to the next voting site. No, 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 buddy. Things change very quickly here. And a lot of time and sometimes not actually actually not a lot. Sometimes those changes impact foreigners. Like right now, there's this whole foreign income tax debate. The tax thing, yeah. That thing, that conversation. Um, and it wasn't designed to hit us, but it will hit us if push comes to shove. Um, so I would say, you know, TLDR, if you're looking to stay here, you're looking to build out uh, like a place to live that's yours, do it. But if you're looking as an investment, be careful. Do some very heavy and deep research beyond somebody who has a vested interest in you actually buying here. Because a lot of people get taken advantage of. Um, a lot of people end up coming here and buying their girlfriends a condo, um, you know, building out a farm uh, in, in, in somebody's, um, in somebody's uh, plot of land that they don't own. It's like, oh, well, yeah, you can go ahead and build out and you can just pay me for the next 10 years. No, 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 no. Uh, what happens after that 10 years? Like, what are you going to do with that land? Because if you sell that land, I'm screwed, right? So a lot of times foreigners come here and get taken advantage of, and it's very hard to find a lawyer or an institution that's going to be looking out for you as a foreigner. Uh, there are a few here and there. Um, I can recommend these to you off camera. But uh, overall, I would say, yeah, stay away from investment here, but definitely uh, invest in your life. But but you bought a place, and I was mm -hmm. curious about this because I think you were the first foreigner I know that's actually purchased really? a condo here. Oh man, there was a lot of us in there. And uh, but you had a decent experience. Ex excellent. Okay, yeah. and then you sold it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Why did you sell it? Uh, I was uh, I was renovating another property. So my big one of my biggest goals here. Um, I'm a veteran of 10 years, military veteran. The way veterans in America are treated is atrocious, it's terrible. Um, I have so many friends and colleagues who I've always said, look, just come for a month to Thailand. You don't have to worry about a place to stay. I will look out for you in terms of food because food's not that expensive. Just come and rest. Sometimes people you care about and love just need a break, right? America is heavy. And factor into that PTSD, factor into that low wages, um, factor into that inflation, factor into that politics and all the other bullshit that comes with being American these days. I wanted to create a place where my friends and family can take a break and rest. So I've always had this idea to build this little retreat. And Bangkok's my home, and I think it's an amazing place to be. So I wanted to build out a piece of property. And you've seen this even in Ekema, in, 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 in the area we're in, is there's, you go down one side, a side so and you see these gated homes yeah. constantly everywhere. Everybody's house is behind a wall. It's this little oasis, these small little, this is your world. This is your place. And I wanted to create something like that. So when I was selling my condo, that was the next step. And I literally already had a contractor. Um, one of my good friends from Chicago actually has a, a construction company here. Um, we, were, we were already in negotiations, getting deposits done. I had already met with my lawyer and my team. The money was in escrow. Everything was moving forward. And then COVID happened. And then like literally the construction team couldn't even get the, in the um, the materials in to do renovations so everything kind of went by the wayside so the original goal of selling because buying a condo was just i want a place to live like this is this is my spot this is mine 
But then it grew into something bigger where I wanted to create a place where people I love and care about can come and just rest. Even if I'm not here, yeah, just go to just go to our resort or our compound or whatever or whatnot. Um, and most people do this up in Chiang Mai. You see this a lot actually in Chiang Mai and Isan. Quite a few foreigners have places like this, but I wanted to do something in a place that I love in Bangkok. Like everybody thinks I love Thailand. I love Thailand, but I adore Bangkok. I can never live anywhere else other than Bangkok in this country. That's a really cool idea. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know what you mean about being in the U.S. and you see some people there and you just wish like, just get out of that bubble yeah. for a little while. Yeah. and Yeah, like I got you, like come. And I've always wanted a place for my mom. Like my mom, my mom's still relatively young, but I've always taken on as it's my responsibility as her eldest son is to take care of her when she can't take care of herself. So whenever my mom says like she can message me tomorrow, say, hey, I'm ready. I'm like, OK, come. Has she been here? No, my mother hasn't been. Yeah. My mother hasn't been yet. Um, it's, it's hard to get her on that flight. Yeah, I, but, my parents just, yeah. I finally convinced them to come here for the first time. Yeah. And it was it was a little rough. So I'm really? curious what your uh, mother, is she, is she open to, to oh, things like that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on YouTube. Oh, okay. I'm going to YouTube it. My mother is me without a filter. And the same curiosity that is in me largely came from my mom. Because my mother has always had this. My mother had a catering business. My mother had a flower decorating business. My mother worked in, in hospitality industry. My mother has always been a worker. Like she always finds ways to make it make a living, but also to be creative and to embrace other people. And I always, I always said there was this conversation about um, there was this man who was upset with his girlfriend. Uh, because she had disrespected his mom and his his mother was living with him at the time and he goes yo that's my mother she always has a place with me and that's the same with me my mother will always have a place and always have a home with me so building out a a, a place and mind you i love my mom but i can't be in the same room with her for three days like in the same house we have a 72 hour rule because we're so similar it's like look mom i love you but i gotta go to a hotel so you've got the apartment, right? Her coming out here would probably be one of the greatest things in my life because that means I made it to a point in my life where I can show my mother the world. If that makes sense. Yeah. Where, cause my mom's, my mom, my mother's originally from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, ended up uh, going to Cleveland cause that's where my grandfather was, um, had me in Cleveland. Um, and then, uh, literally spent her entire life in Cleveland. And she's obviously going to Vegas, seeing our family in Texas, in Atlanta, but she's never been out of the United States. And for me to have the ability and the means, and which I've had for years, um, or actually the ability to convince her to come abroad would be a huge life goal for me to get her overseas. And I firmly believe once she gets out here, she's not going to want to leave because everything my mother loves is here. There's very the, one of the benefits of living in Thailand and Bangkok is we don't really want for anything. You can have and now that the cheesecake factory is here. Oh yeah, I'm never don't going home started. again. I'm never going home. I'm never going home. My birthday dinner is there on Saturday. <laughs> I love it, man. But yeah, that's that's the, the the one of the biggest things about you know buying property and renovating and own real estate here is having that uh, ability and opportunity to provide a place, a safe and comfortable place for people I love and care about. That's. That's awesome. I, I kind of, I think I know how you feel. Like when you find something like this that you love so much, you want to share it with the people that you care about. Yeah, that's why I keep doing Minority Nomad. Like yeah. I can, man, I can never post on social media and be good for the rest of my life. Like everybody thinks I'm this influencer. I don't like social media. I don't like being on the internet. There's just nobody, there's nobody doing what I do honestly, in my opinion. There's nobody who's saying the things that make you unpopular. Like we were talking about off camera. There's nothing I won't talk about. Yeah, I wanted to ask you one uh, thing that I I loved uh, watching from you is you went to Wonder Fruit Festival. So w- yeah. Wonder Fruit is how long has it been in Thailand? Oh God, maybe 2015, 2014 was the first one. Yeah, I can't not, remember. Not, not too yeah, long. Yeah, it's not super long. But I feel like in the last few years, mm-hmm. it's become a lot more popular. Oh yeah, by far. And um, I remember, I think even last year. You went, right? Yeah. And I, I think I watched year. you then. I'm so I, it's one of those things I wondered about, but mm-hmm. I liked you going because I felt like I was there. Yeah. And you gave a very honest breakdown of things you liked, things you didn't like, mm-hmm. and kind of how it's evolved. So mm-hmm. 
since a lot of people are, you know, either heard of it or have gone, tell, tell me a little bit about that. How has Wonder Fruit changed from year to year? And what do you think about it as a festival? Who goes? It's interesting. Um, I love Wonder Fruit. And, um, you know, full transparency, uh, I do a lot of behind the scenes work with Wonder Fruit. Um, and this literally came from exactly what you said. I was raised in hell last year about Wonder Fruit. Well, not last year, 2022. Um, because there were such a there were so many problems on the first day. Uh, there was issues with transportation, price gouging, lack of water, the bathrooms. It, it was atrocious. And I posted all of this publicly because I don't work for anybody. I'm a freelancer. I do the be, I've been offered so many bylines over the years and I've turned everyone down because with a byline comes barriers. And Eric Prince will always say what he wants to say. And by doing that, it creates this connection with people in the audience. Whenever you see me on camera, I am talking to you directly. I'm not talking to some algorithm. I'm talking to you as a personal individual. And if something pisses me off, I'm sure it's going to piss off somebody else. So I'm like, hey, this is messed up. This needs to be fixed. And luckily, people and organizations that actually care about their product and their customer base, they pay attention when people say those things. Now, granted, I'll say 5% negative stuff and 95% is positive, but most people gravitate towards the negative stuff, negative negativity bias. But I say it in a constructive way. I just don't raise hell about stuff and not give a solution or propose a, a, a fix to this thing. And if they reach out to me and say, hey, how do you think we can fix this? I'm with you. Let's go. Let's try to get this right for everybody. So what Wonder Food has seen is an influx of a lot of different things. It's an influx of different kind of foreigners in terms of the demographics that go um, an influx of money from different sponsors um, and a lot of a lot of negative attention in terms of rave culture and like the whole TikTok raver. I don't know if you're a raver, but I've, I've been a raver since the 90s and I love the party culture. But with that comes a lot of negativity, negative things in terms of alcohol, drugs, fights, all those things. Hasn't hit wonderful in a massive way like it, say Coachella or Tomorrowland or EDC in Vegas, which is atrocious. What Wonder Fruit always build yourself as was a it's not a music festival. It's a cultural festival and they have separate pillars. They have food. They have wellness. They have music. They have the, 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 they have nature. They have all these different pillars that they focus on. And people who go just for music, which is a lot now from Europe, because that's all you have in Europe. You have music festivals, but not a lot of culture festivals. You have people who are going and just expect do do they expect David Guetta or the Swedish House Mafia or Diplo or Skrillex? You will not see them at Wonder Fruit. That's not who they are. Wonder Fruit is you're going to see Gasper. You're going to see uh, the people, the guys from Disco Diaries. You're going to see uh, Voss who uh, who's over at Mustache. You're going to see local DJs. You're going to see international performers in terms of Asian performers. You're going to see wellness. You're going to have yoga. You're going to have um, you're going to have um, sound baths. You're going to have uh, the Wim Hof ice bath methods, and you're definitely going to have parties at night. But how it's evolved is there's so many more people from different cultures looking for something different when before COVID, it was very clear what it was. And now the wonderful team has to cater to too many people. So every single year, there's going to be people who leave disappointed and they have to become comfortable with that. You have to stick to your ethos. And I've said this, uh, everything I'm saying now, I've said directly to the team, is you have to become significantly more comfortable with being disliked. And you're going to lose people. Like, I would never go to Burning Man again because of what it's become. Or Coachella, because of what it's become. I have fond memories of what it was. But I'm okay with walking away with that. And I think Coachella's just fine. <laughs> They're okay with me not showing up, right? So, me being honest... Me being clear, like this year, I don't know if you saw my coverage this year. I did, yeah. The luxury, we spent a lot of money on our luxury tent, and it was not worth it. 
I was I, I, I was I was actively upset about it. And I talked to the team about I was livid. I went over, I was like, yo, this is unacceptable. For for the price that you're charging us for this tent, like I believe it was fifty thousand this year. Fifty thousand baht for the tent for four days. And the air conditioning was messed up. There were um there were a lot of issues with the tents. They acknowledged that. They, you know, obviously I didn't get my money back, but they acknowledged it and they're gonna to try to do better in the future and we'll see next year. But what's gonna happen is next year I won't be standing in luxury tents because of that experience. I'll stay off site again. So, you know, Wonder Food has evolved in a lot of really good ways. But we shall see. I'm going to wait to December of this year, but I still highly recommend it to anybody who's never been there. It does look like a really cool experience. Yeah. And just so people know, it's in December, right? December. December. December in, the week before Christmas. And where Elmer. is it? It's around Kauai? No, or? no, no. It's in uh, Pattaya. It's at uh, Siam oh. Country Club. This is exactly oh, okay. So not Every even year. that far? Nope. Not far oh, at all. Okay, cool. Yeah. You can literally go down for the weekend. Like, yeah. I go for the entire festival. I love it. But a lot of Bangkokians go down just for the weekend. Yeah. They go down, they go down, they get off work Friday, they go down there Friday, Saturday, come back Sunday. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Did you go to Rolling Loud last year? Unfortunately, I did. Yeah. It was terrible. So, uh, so I'm sorry. And I'm interested in the music festival stuff. You mm -hmm. don't know this. I have a business in the U.S. with a partner. Mm -hmm. We produce EDM events. Oh, that's what's up. So th this kind of thing is close to my heart, yeah. which is why I love watching your stories. Because yeah. you give, I, I relate and empathize with your situation because normally, you know, people are, people are giving me the feedback, giving yeah, me yeah. and my partner the feedback. So, yeah. um, but Rolling Loud, how, what was that like? It was one of the worst festivals I've ever been yeah. to in my life. It was it, it was disgustingly bad. It w it was such a disgrace to hip hop, to Thailand. It was, I I hated everything about it. Okay, the baby put on a really good show. Chris Brown put on a great show. Cardi B, they put on phenomenal. So are shows. you not talking about like the production or the? I'm talking about every aspect okay. of it because was they terrible. had it during Songkran. I it think. was during Songkran. Which is who's the genius that thought of that? It was it because was. During Songkran, if you don't know, if you're not from here, they have festival after festival after festival mm -hmm. during that week. Yep. And, they and just it's water. And it was like you be in Padia and you'd be on your way to roll and loud and you get a bucket of water dumped on you. So now you're soaking wet going yeah. to a hip hop festival. And mind you, the hip hop festival, there's no shade out. Uh, there's no respite. Literally, April is the hottest time of the year in Thailand. It is blazing hot and you have people at a festival barely enough water for everybody and it's basically on a, a tarmac it's basically on an airport tarmac it's on so asphalt no shade. no shade at all it's blazing hot and it was like and then the stages are so far apart and it was basically there was only two stages yeah, I'm I'm thinking back. There's there was two stages basically, and these they had a like the smaller little uh, little VIP area. But the two main stages, you music would stop at one stage, and there was just nothing. And then you just had to walk over to the other stage and hope something was going that you liked. But it it was just it was poorly organized. It was a terrible location. The time of year sucked. The it it, it was not good. It wasn't good in any way. Yeah. And I, I didn't go, but I just saw some of the, the photos and the videos, and I thought that he got to be losing money because oh. it didn't look like it was it was a lot of attendance. It, it was packed. I will say this. It was packed, but, but, every, but here's the thing about Thailand. Thai people don't deal with the sun. Like So if you have a festival that starts during the day, you're not going to see a lot of Thai people there uh, unless they're working an event. When the sun goes down, that's when everybody shows up. So as... As the evening kind of set in, and we're we're out of there, I'm I'm leaving because I don't want to deal with the the chaos of getting back into Patia um, after Chris Brown's set. Right, like, I want to see three or four Chris Brown songs, and I'm out. As I'm going out, waves of people are coming in because, and then the festival ends at midnight. Like I want to say it was like twelve, it was shutting down. So I'm like, yeah, we just came in to see chris breezy which i get it like or cardi b or uh travis scott i'm like all right cool but what was the point of all this all this money that we spent on these tickets when you have your headliners who go on at this time you have nothing else around it beyond these headliners there's no oh, excuse me when you think about edm festival as an organizer there's other things happening as well. There's other acts. There's other acts. There's smaller stages, like little DJs in between sets. I'm like, oh man, I didn't know who this was. I enjoyed yeah, this you music. Need to support. The yeah, big something acts. else. Something yeah. like you need support to keep people in t entertained. Like 
I, I I would say this, and I know he. May, I guess he got canceled or whatever. The baby is one of the best live hip hop performers on the planet Earth. That kid, that the baby live is was one of the best hip hop experiences I've ever had, and I'm I'm a huge hip hop fan. And what they what, to their credit, Rolling Loud did a really good job in get, letting him shine. Uh, Titanium, uh, which is a, a Thai group, they were phenomenal. DJ Callow was up there. The Bangkok Invaders who organized the whole thing, they put on a show. But outside of that, as a festival, it was absolutely atrocious. Huh. Well, they're coming back, so Ugh. are you going this year? No. Not even like no. press media? <sighs> This could be your thing. The, the, I like how you cover the, the festivals. It's and the tough, concerts. man. It's really tough because, you know, I have this thing. I don't do anything that I don't like. Yeah. Um, and last year, I'm like, why? It would have to be a hell of a lineup. If they get Wu-Tang, I'll go. Okay. Get Wu-Tang and, and, and I'll show up. Kind of along that topic, you know, when I was in the U.S., I never listened to hip hop, hmm. you know. When I came to Thailand, I got more into it. Hmm. And I wondered, why is this? And I think part of it is, in the U.S., it feels like almost I'm not allowed to be. It's harder for me to be in environments to experience that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, but here, I feel like it's it's just more accessible. Yeah. and You could, you could be whoever you want. That's one of the good, cool things about being abroad as an American. You could be whoever you want to be, no matter what. Like in the U.S., there's these invisible lines or barriers. It was like, oh, what are you doing here, white boy? What are you yeah, like, exactly? Yeah, what yeah. What you doing here? Yeah. Like, you're not allowed. Can you imagine if I went to like a hip hop show in like New York or? Boston it's definitely or different now. It's I would, different now, you know, but it, you know, but but, but I, I definitely get what you're saying. Well, what, how do you think like Asian people, Thai people relate to hip hop? Because obviously, mm -hmm. hip hop has such a strong tie mm -hmm. to a certain segment of American culture. Yeah. And I think for the for the most part, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but for the most part, Thai people have no idea what's going on in the music they just but, like the beat or whatever well the story the story like a, a lot of people especially people who don't understand hip-hop <clears throat> or who didn't grow up on hip-hop i think the greatest storyteller in african-american history one of them is tupac shakur if you want to understand what it was like to be a, a young black man growing up in the 80s and 90s in america listen to tupac don't listen to you know just the bankers, you know, in California. Listen to Brenda's Got a Baby. Like, listen, listen to the entire Machiavelli album from start to finish. Listen to the lyrics of what he's saying and the stories he's telling. Biggie is up there as well. Jay Z is up there as well. Nas is up there as well. Most Def is up there as well. KRS One during his time. Hip hop was about telling stories, about telling our stories. It wasn't about feeding the algorithm. It wasn't necessarily about making all the money in the world. I blame Puffy for that. But hip hop was about telling our story and our history about who we are as a people and a community. A lot of those stories come from places of abuse, of poverty, uh, of, of hunger, of marginalization, of fighting against a structure that isn't built for us, but we're forced to participate in it. That's not a uniquely black American experience. That's a human experience. So when you see people in Klong Toy uh, who are embracing hip hop culture and creating their own art, it makes sense because they're dealing with some of the same things that we deal with. Like when we can look out of our windows of high rise apartments and you see slums right there where people are forced to look at our, our penthouses, where people are forced to serve us rice and chicken on the side of the street for what we consider nothing. Like to them, that 30 baht is a meal. To us, 30 baht is less than a dollar. We throw that away. So when you hear Thai hip hop, you're hearing their story of abuse, of oppression, of hunger, of poverty. And it just so happens to be set to a catchy beat. So there's not that much difference between Thai hip hop and American hip hop, as we call it, or UK hip hop. It's just a different trap, as we call it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Where do you like to go out in the city on mm. a weekend or where do you, where do you party <sighs> if you party? It's different for me because uh, I work so heavily in F and B now. Uh, a lot of my work is with uh, clubs and bars and restaurants, and hotels. You can normally find me at, oh, it depends on the mood. Now, if it's a turn up, let's get wild kind of night. Cheesecake factory. Oh, <laughs> get loose on the cake. It's probably going to be 
somewhere around Sukhumvit. Uh, I'm going to go to Whiskars, have some cigars, listen to some jazz. Uh, might make my way up to Saxophone over by Victory Monument. If I want some really good cocktails, I'm going over to Soy Nana near Chinatown. Um, you know, Teens of, Thailand, Teens of Thailand, Asia Today, Wallflowers, um, Independence Bar, um, even Tax. I'll go up to Tax. Are you a nightclub person at all? Not anymore. Um, I use it because nightclubs in Thailand aren't nightclubs. They're basically, they're bars with music where you have basically the dance floor is covered in tables. Yeah. It's now, a very unique thing here. Yeah, when I, yeah. when I, you know, if you guys haven't been here, a lot of these Thai style clubs, they like in America, maybe you have a nightclub with a DJ and a dance floor mm-hmm. and then maybe some like VIP tables VIP around it. Just, right. And the majority of people though are just kind of mingling on the dance floor. But in, in Bangkok, at least, a lot of the clubs, they're filled with these like little tables. Yeah. And standing people tables. are just standing around their little table yeah. drinking. And there's not as much as that. Uh, it's not a dance culture yeah. here. It's definitely not. But there are a few places. Um, I love mustache. I uh, love mustache. So I'm a Berlin kid. So I love uh, rave culture, like techno culture in Berlin because people dance. Like this is interesting. Everybody finds it interesting, uh, and I'm a DJ as well. Everybody finds it interesting. I DJ EDM, uh, mainly house music. Um, I, I do uh, soul, soulful house, disco house, uh, funky house, um, because it makes people dance. You dance. You cannot if you're if somebody's not dancing and I'm DJing, I'm upset. My goal is to get you to dance, not sway back and forth, but I want you to sweat and dance. That's what music is to me. So. When I go to a mustache, we're dancing. If you go, like, you go to a, um, a sugar club, it's bottles. That's, you know, yeah. there's Bangkok has two hip hop clubs. People pretend it's more, it's not. You have Sugar Club on Sukhumvit 11, and you have Sway in Tonglo. Sway is the best hip hop club in the city because they have the best DJs by far. It's not even close. Nobody's close to Sway. People still actually dance at Sway even though there are tables everywhere, right? If I'm going, if I'm looking for uh, more, more of a, a chill groovy vibe, that's when you'll find me at the rooftop bars. So I'll go to, um, I know Brewski's is probably my favorite, uh, a, a top floor of Radisson Blue. It's funny, uh, someone else that was on here yeah. said the same thing. Yeah, I love Brewski's. Yeah. Uh, and I and think the reason I love Brewski's over say at Tichuca, um, is uh, brewskis you don't have all the influencers you don't have all the you know fake models you don't have that yeah, the, those ridiculous prices that people are paying for everything it's just a you know short flip flop vibe great views of the city um, you know a, a good craft beer is going to run you about 250 to 300 baht it's a it's a real chill spot that's why I love brewskis um, if I'm looking for a, a boys night out I'm definitely going go go bars like I, I, I absolutely I'm still I am that expat that still will go to go go bars yeah. with his friends. What is uh, so Nana versus Soy Cowboy? Soy versus- Cowboy is not even close. No, no, no. There's no versus. It's Nana. That's it. <laughs> it's Nana. Yeah, Soy Cowboy is a tourist trap. Uh, go to Nana Plaza. Oh, Soy Cowboy is the tourist trap. Soy Cowboy is the tourist trap. <laughs> okay. I'm telling you. It's hot, and I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm, I'm going to tell you off camera yeah. where, where you go in uh, okay. Nana Plaza. Actually, I, I need to know this that. because my friend, he's, he hasn't been to Nana Plaza yet. Yeah. And I said I would take him. I got a spot for it. But, I uh, need places for I'm it. not an expert it's like some I, people. I got so. places okay. for you. Okay. But uh, the reason I do, and the reason I adore um, Nana Plaza, for example, is this is one of the benefits of being black. So as soon as we arrive, we're the cool kid. Like, because people understand us. They know our culture. Like you as a white dude, you're you're a white guy. So you're you're normal here. Like you've been white guys have been here forever, right? This has been a stop for European men for years. But it's only within the last 15 to 20 years that you started to see a lot more black men coming through here and black women. So when we show up to the club, they've been consuming our culture forever. And a lot of people complain about the representation of African-Americans in media, but it's largely positive in pop culture abroad. So you have President Obama, you have Tupac and Biggie in hip hop culture, you have Will Smith. And, um, you know, to a certain extent, Dwayne Rock Johnson, uh, who's half black. Like, so black, generally speaking, people see us like, oh, snaps, what's up? What are you doing? We go into a go-go bar in Nana Plaza, especially me 
specifically because I'm extroverted. I love to dance. I love to party. I want everybody around me to have party. So we show up and the energy level goes through the roof because we're coming to dance and have fun because we bring a American strip club culture. In the States, dancers know if everybody's not having fun, you ain't making no money. If you go to, I don't know how many strip clubs you've been to in Boston. Zero. But if you go to Atlanta. Yeah. This is where, if you look at Jazzy Faye, look at Goody Mob, look at Ludacris, look at Little John and the Eastside Boys, look at T.I., all these people from Atlanta. All of these guys came out of that strip club culture. Hip hop and strip club culture go hand in hand. Hand in hand, that energy, that sexuality, that dancing, that fun, that's what it comes from. And br- basically, go go bars here are brothels. That's kind of how they operate. They're not strip clubs. But when you go in there with that energy, like, look, I'm here to have fun. Let's get a bottle, let's buy some drinks, get some lap dances. Everybody's going to have a good time. They feel that. So they can have a good time as well. They're not just sitting there waiting to be taken home. They're having fun. And when you move with that energy, place explodes. It lights up. And everybody's having a good time, which is why I always go to Nana Plaza. If I'm looking for a turn up with the fellas, yeah, we're taking over the top floor. You're their new uh, brand ambassador. (laughs) (laughs) I would love it. They they, they pay me in 20 bucks. I'm going to ask you after this. They pay me in 20 bucks. Um, just, I want to mention something or touch on something you mentioned, um, the skin color thing. Mm -hmm. Do you ever, have you ever had any negative experiences here? (sighs) Not really. Um, but also I, I don't, and and this is a tricky conversation because with, even within the African American community, we have this conversation about colorism, uh, about how people engage with us. Um, uh, I'm, I'm the guy who never turns down a photo. If somebody says, hey, can I have a picture with you? Yeah, sure. doesn't bother me. I don't. Uh, uh, but a lot of people are like, what are you going to do with the photo? What are you? I, I'm, I don't care what you do with the photo. Like, Because for, for me, it's a positive interaction with another human being. That's how I look at it. Um, I get the, hey, brother. Hey, homie. What up, my homie? What up, my nigga? Like, From Thai people. Oh, yeah. All, all the time. Thai people. Do, do, um, it, it's across the board. I, I get it. Oh, what up, my brother? I'm like, hey, what's up, man? Like. I do not take it in offense um, because I know it's not coming from a place of maliciousness. Now, granted, I know for a fact that there's an aspect of Thai society where I will never be able to marry their daughter. I know that for a fact because of the color of my skin. I've been told this to my face very clearly and directly and had some amazing conversations about it. And I accept that. I'm like, okay, it is what it is. That's, how it goes if your daughter feels that she wants to respect her family in that way or adhere to their rules then she ain't the one for me anyway right so speaking overall i think actually i get more attention for my size as like being bigger especially when i'm training for a powerlifting competition or something like even the police always the cop the amount of times i've had police officers grab my biceps (laughs) And like talk about weightlifting and training with me, it, it's astronomical. Like at least fifty times over the years, just having these really human interactions with other people. And I think I always say this: being black abroad is a superpower because people are just curious. People are just like, "Hey, what are you? What are what are you doing here?" Because it's still a relatively rare thing to see, uh, especially African American in, uh, in a lot of places abroad, because. Contrary to popular belief, most countries in the world are homogenous. We're not the melting culture, the melting pot that the U.S. or the U.K. are, for example. You go to a place, there's not a lot of black folk outside of Africa, obviously, and parts of Southern Europe, but most people aren't, they don't look like me. So when I show up and, you know, people are engaging with me because of my skin color, 99.9% is positive. I've only had two instances where racism was very clear it was in buenos aires argentina and st petersburg russia other than that pretty good oh okay yeah Yeah, i mean i love to hear kind of the from people that have actually experienced this because you you read things in the news or you talk to other people but Mm. i would have honestly thought it would have been a lot different i would have thought 
because Thailand is such a homogen- homogenous culture, because the I feel like the way they 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 judge you very strongly based on your appearance. Mm-hmm. Oh, you look like you're European. Oh, you're Asian. You're mm-hmm. you know whatever. You're African. So I don't know. Well, part of the but I would say this: the experience is not the same for people who present as continental Africans. I am very clearly. African American. Uh, see, I was going to ask you: Do they uh, even know? No, they they are very Thai people. know. there's a very clear, and and I get in trouble for saying this sometimes. Africans and African Americans are not the same. Right, we are not the same at all. See, I know that there's because a, I'm American. Yeah, but I would imagine that yeah. here in Asia, oh, they know. They they definitely know. There's a very there's interesting. A, there's a there's a difference. There there's a very clear difference, and 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 again, we have different cultures as well. We were caught like. The United States and Nigeria are not the same culturally. They're two very different places. And I get in a lot of trouble with other African-Americans about this conversation. And I'm like, no, continental Africans will tell you, you aren't us. You're American. You, you, you don't you didn't face the same struggles as we did in Nigeria or Botswana or Tanzania or Ghana or even South Africa to an extent. You did not experience this. So you are you and we are us different cultures. When you come here. Literally at the airport, we're treated differently. My American passport is very different than a Nigerian passport. My experience is very different just on the very first interaction with a Thai person, the immigration agent. It's very different. So, of course, societally, the experience is going to be different and how we interact and see each other. When you see me, I am a consider a light skin American, clearly. So, and the way I dress, the way I speak, as soon as I open my mouth, you know exactly where I'm from. So, I will leave the experience of a continental African to a continental African. I can introduce you to a few that you might want to have on um, to them to explain to you. But from what I've seen, it's not as positive as my experience as an African-American. man. Specifically, one that does not even come close to presenting as a continental African. Cool. Thank you for being so open about that. Because no, no some of us, you know, I, we we're out and I don't know. I think about these things sometimes. Mm. Different have different experiences. So you've been here for ten years now. Almost ten years. Yeah, yeah. You're still relatively young. Yeah. Do you foresee spending the rest of your years in Thailand, or you yeah. think you'll move on somewhere else? No, no. This is it. This is it. I found my happy yeah. place. Now, granted, um, like this year, I'm going to be doing a lot more time here in Thailand. I want to create more content for people. I, f- I see that there's this massive wave of foreigners moving to Thailand, even more so than ever. Um, and a lot of them are African American and Latinos. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation going around. There's the TikTok generation. I'm like, how the hell do you guys put this out with a straight face? Because this is bullshit. I mean, it's the the amount of I am sorry, guys. Please stop using TikTok as a standard of information. Stop. At least go to Instagram where you can get a little bit more accurate information. Um, Use Facebook groups. Use blogs. Anything but TikTok. It's atrociously bad. And a lot of misinformation is being put out in the world. And I'm not necessarily a complaining kind of person. I just like to fix it or at least provide an alternative information. So if somebody comes to me and says, hey, man. Uh, and you cannot speak to the experience of an African-American living in Bangkok. You can't. No matter how many African-American friends you have, th- th- you cannot speak to the real life experience that I have as a black man living here. So for me, and this is the only reason Minority Nomad is still going to this day, is I still feel a, a responsibility to my community to provide up-to-date and accurate information on whatever I'm doing that they're trying to do as well. Because so many people reach out to me and say, hey, how do I do what you do? How do I live the life that you live? How do I get out there? How do I live in Thailand long term? And some things are going to be um, cross, uh, cross cultural. For example, buying a condo it doesn't matter the color of your skin necessarily, but something like dating that's very specific. Like, what is it like dating as a black man in Bangkok? That's very specific, right? But what is it like? opening a business as a Westerner. No, oh, that, that, that's general, that's general yeah. information, right? So even the people of color that I see here creating content, they've been here five minutes and present themselves as an expert here. 
And I'm like, no, you you don't actually know anything. If you've not been to Isan, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. If you have not been to, it's like somebody saying they're an expert on the United States of America and never going to the South. Because that's what Isan is. Isan right. is the South. Of even those. That's a good know, analogy. Yeah, the East. Everything great about Thailand comes from Isan. The 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 people, the cuisine, the 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 kindness, the community, the the dance, the culture, the music. It's all from Isan, and most people never go to Isan. The people who live here three, four years and never go to Isan. Yeah. The biggest province in the country. I haven't been to Isan yet. Yeah. I've been to be the North, I've been to Mae Hong San. I've been to some rural yeah. places. Go to Isan. But haven't been to Isan yet. <laughs> go to Isan. I, I guess I have to find a girl to take me. Maybe. Oh, bro. Bro, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll you. go to Nana Plaza yeah, and find uh, one. I'll tour again. Uh, and, and here's the funny thing. Um, a lot of a lot of those girls are Isan. Sure. Uh, there's no go go girl, go go culture without Isan. A lot of people who work in the hospitality. Or from Isan. A lot of the best dishes are from Isan. Sure. So one last thing before you get out of here, because I know mm. you're going to run. If someone wants to move to Thailand, whether they're coming from America, from Europe, wherever, they I get this this kind of question all the time. They, they love it. They see it online. Maybe mm. they visited once, but they don't know how to make the move here. Mm. What are like the first three things they need to do to, to get over here? Number one, uh, source of income. Uh, get your money right. Uh, number two, visit and spend like like not a two week holiday but come for a couple months um and three get comfortable with being uncomfortable um thailand does not care about you beyond your money like let's be very clear about something um these you, you got a lot of these old head expats who are bitching and moaning in these uh forums about how thailand's changing and it's but no 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 thailand's just never been for you it's built for thai people legislation is made for thai people and it doesn't serve you anymore so you're upset about it um a lot of people come out here with no financial plan i'm actually going to make a piece of content here very soon there's this sister who came out here with basically no money um and you know living off the kindness of strangers ended up kind of you know surviving and i'm like no, everybody's oh, this is so inspiring and this is so No, it's not. It's fucking stupid. It's stupid. Don't do it. Don't come out here without a financial plan. You need at least six months of a financial plan. Because guess what? Most foreigners can't work here. You can't work here in certain industries. A lot of people don't know this. Like there are industries that are most industries are locked out outside of a few that will allow foreigners to work in. So foreigners don't take over the country. That's why the 49% condo ownership thing exists. So foreigners don't take over the country. So people who are like, oh, you know, I'll just go work in the hotels. No, you won't. Some special circumstances, but you're not just going to show up and get a job here. Maybe teaching English and the salary. But I want to say the average salary is about 35 to 40,000 bottom month. And yeah, I'm, it's I'm like $1,000 dollars a month. Yeah. And you're living off that? You're living off that and trying to live up to what standard? Yeah. What makes you comfortable, right? The financial part, top of the list. You got to figure your money out, right? My biggest, I'm like, look, have, save around twenty to 24000 Like, And this is me being super conservative. This is me, uh, this is the big brother Eric talking. This is my, look, if you got twenty k in the bank, do it. Take the leap of, go. Because you have that net, you have that cushion, to figure it out, right? You have that nest egg, right? Thailand is a place where 20,000 goes a very long way, very long way, especially depending on where you go. If you go to Isan, 20,000 is, you're good, good in Isan. Bangkok, yeah, six, seven months of solid, good, fun living, right? Six, seven months. If you really want to live here, you're like, hey, I want to live here. Come out for two to three months and explore the country. So say do three weeks in Bangkok, you know, three weeks up in Chiang Mai region, do three, four weeks on the island, go to Isan three, four weeks, explore the country and learn, learn about the culture and the history. Don't just stick in these expat bubbles because we do that often where all your friends are just other expats or retirees. Actually make friends with Thai locals who are also interested in the same things that you are like. I would say easily, if you take 10 of my friends, six to seven are Thai. 
So embrace the culture in that way and learn where you fit in into that place, right? In the U.S. specifically, when something is bad or goes wrong, you can say that publicly. Like, fuck this, this sucks. Thailand, you can't. We don't have freedom of speech here necessarily. There are certain people and things that we can't talk about publicly or we won't be here very long. Or we're going to have a police officer literally knocking on our door and say, hey, I saw you posted this on Instagram and TikTok. There's, the, I don't know if you knew about this. There was a very popular uh, French blogger who was running his mouth and he was breaking some of the Thai laws about what you can say publicly. And when he went home during COVID and came back, they were like, uh-uh. You can't come back. Now, I think they eventually let them back in, but they, they were very clear, like, nah, this is our country, buddy. So coming, like, those three things, find financial stability, ha, come in and actually seeing what it really is like here outside of the tourist bubble, and being comfortable with being uncomfortable, really. Like, I, I would say those things, and I mean, obviously, we both can make a long list of things, but those things that give you a solid foundation. The, the right? last one, I think, is is key yeah. because yeah. especially if you're coming from like i don't know where you're you know america yeah you're very used to things being a certain way yep and to just throw that out the window and just be open to new things yeah t-i-t this is thailand man oh yeah that's the phrase this is thailand this right? is thailand man like it's and you'll hear expats say that like we'll complain and bitch them on and eventually it's going to come to the conversation ends when you're like yo man t-i-t it is yeah. what it is. And you just like, that's the expat version of Sabai Sabai. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, where can people find you online? Uh, on all platforms, uh, Minority Nomad. Minority uh, Nomad. Uh, I'll put the info in the description. Mainly below. Instagram, though. Instagram is where you, uh, I, I would say, find me on Instagram only yeah. because that's where you're going to get my response. Like, yeah, if you send me that's DM, where I like, watch it most of the yeah. time. Yeah. If you, if, and, and Instagram is the more raw, uncut. It's just me living life on Instagram. Yeah. That's why I love Instagram stories. It's my favorite platform. So Instagram right. stories, uh, slide in my DMs. I pretty much answer everybody unless you're an asshole. And then I'll, I'll probably cut you out and block you. <laughs> cool. Thank you for stopping by. Oh, my pleasure, man. I'm glad we got to do this. Guys, if you want to see more of what's happening here in Bangkok, Hit the subscribe button and we will see you in the next one.